make sure to both are symmetrical for this one is okay lah alright both patella face forward however some patients you may not be able to get that for example in a general barium knee then they ah uh, if they turn then after that their body also have to turn and all that just report as it is it's okay one it is reality just mention that I'm unable to place both patients patella to face forward and the patient is having difficulty with that uh, and then you can say patient has a risk of fall this is what happened to my patient during my uh, long case I got a very complex traumatic mouth union with equinus contraction, limb length discrepancy, externally rotated everything. Uh, ideally, I should I need to do a channel number test for the patient. The patient wants to step also very difficult already. So I just mentioned to the examiner, the patient has got a risk of fall. So I will not proceed with a channel number test. Okay. Right. If you do it and the patient fall, huh, then I will feel. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now right. on closer inspection, again SWAD, swelling, scar, sinus, skin changes, any quadriceps muscle wasting. All right, any obvious deformity. From the side, are the knee flex in position? All right, is it flex in position? Usually it's flex uh, uh, in OA or in a very severely painful knee. Uh, it will be in flex position. So this is straight. And then posteriorly, you look at a few things. Number one, posterior knee line. Are they located at the same level? All right, because it could indicate a limb length discrepancy. Number two, any swelling at the popliteal fossa, uh, baker cyst or semi-membranous uh, bursitis. All right. And after that, you look at the hind foot, just roughly co comment, the hind foot is normal. Normal hind foot is normal hind foot vulgus, four to five degrees. Vulgus means, you see this is his Achilles tendon. You will go like this a bit. Understand, this is about four to five degrees. This is normal, hind foot vulgus. It should not be various. Various is like this. It's vulgar for the side. That's normal. All right. Then you can comment on the media longitudinal arch if you want. But even if you don't comment on the knee, I think that's fine because it's a knee examination. All right. Then after that, can you please walk there and come back? The gait that usually you would anticipate in a patient with okay, different different scenario ah, for OA. All right. Various trust. You've got a various. What does various truss mean? It has a secondary movement of further collapse during Stern's phase. That's the definition. That means when the when you see the patient already got a various, but when during the single leg Stern's phase like that, it go into even more various. There's a secondary movement, okay, of a translation of a various. That's called a various truss. Vulgus is the other side, huh? the other way around. So during the single leg stance phase, there's a secondary movement with an increase in the valgus movement. All right, that's very good. Then they can have antalgic gait. Antalgic gait is just a painful gait, right? And then after that, so what they will demonstrate is a single short stance phase. All right, so short stance. Okay, but their shoulder level, everything is the same. Now you could have a uh, uh, what do you call it? short limb gait. Huh? Short limb gait is shoulder set on the same side. Hmm? Shoulder set on the same side. So the shoulder will go down because it's a uh, shorter limb. But mind you that some patients with shorter limb, they compensate by what? Tiptoeing. Alright. So that is a variation of the short limb gait. Again, just report as it is. The shoulder level are balanced. However, there's absence of the q -tuck. The patient is tiptoeing throughout. Okay, so that's another form of a short limb gait, a variation. All right. Then after that, we talk about Trendelenburg gait. Okay, you need to know Trendelenburg gait, whereby the patient have got the abductor muscle weakness, the shoulder will sag towards the contralateral side, and the whole body will try to compensate because you're going to fall down already. So we'll try to shift towards the ipsilateral side. Now, a lot of you will get confused with this Trendelenburg, but I hope that after today, you'll be clear. All right. So, if a patient walk with a channel number, let's say now, uh, my right side is a weakness. My right side is a weakness. This is the abductor muscle. So, it cannot contract. When it is functioning properly, it is contracting, so it should be like this. When it cannot function properly, it will drop like that. It will drop like that. So, my pelvis will set or tilt on the contralateral side. And of course, the patient themselves are not going to let them fall, fall like that. So, how they compensate? They shift their body towards this side. But actually their pelvis is tilting towards that side. Understand? 
Okay, all right. So that is the basis of your channel number. Yeah. Okay, we'll talk about channel number test later, and the channel number, our uh, channel number gate and channel number test later in detail. So, <clears throat> in a knee, they can have quadriceps avoidance kit. Quadriceps avoidance kit means that when you when you then touch like that, you see the entire lower limb is actually straight one. But when you have quadriceps avoidance kit, means that they don't go into full extension. They don't lock their knee. Uh, they don't have the knee locking mechanism, so they just walk like that. So there's always a lack of full extension of the lower limb. This is called a quadriceps avoidance game. Now, it usually it can be due to either pain or due to weakness of their quadriceps. And it, uh, the next question they may ask you, what will happen if this one, the patient is developing this quadriceps avoidance game? The thing is, the complication is the gate is not efficient because they don't have this knee locking mechanism. Because knee locking mechanism is only possible during the terminal 15 degrees of your knee extension. During the f final 15 degrees of your knee extension, there is external tibia rotation, isn't it? In relation to your femur. Alright, that's knee locking mechanism. And it will lock your knee, it reduces the effort by the quadriceps muscle. But when it never go into knee locking mechanism, then your quadriceps is going to work harder. Uh, Alright, so the energy expenditure is actually much greater. Okay, so then after that, for all lower limb, I will ask my patient to squat down if they can. Because that is very useful to check a lot of things. Check for their proximal muscle power, see whether their function, because a lot of our daily function we need to squat huh, in order to decide. So would you be able to squat down? Hmm. Okay, squat and then come up. All right. Okay, just whether the patient is able to perform or not. If the patient uh, suck it up, like my patient, there's a patient, uh, patient's uh, have this pain and all that. I just supaya yang boleh. Saya cakap tak boleh. Then okay lah. Then say I cannot perform patient is unable to perform squatting. Just report as it is. Okay. All right. Now the next thing is that. <coughs> all right. So next two things here. You are gonna ask the patient to extend the knee and then flex the knee. All right. Can you extend? And then can you flex? You are looking for patella mouth tracking. Patella mouth tracking is seen. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Remember, it's seen when the knee goes from flexion into extension. <coughs> patella mouth tracking is seen when the knee goes from flexion into extension. And the patella pop up. Okay. Then the second thing you want to do, place your hand here. Can you extend? And flex. Crepitus. Knee crepitus pop up. After you ask the patient to lie down. <coughs> Again, closer inspection. Any obvious quadriceps muscle wasting anything that you miss just now that you want to mention. Then feel any increase in warm around the knee compared to the contralateral knee. Alright. Then after that, <coughs> you do the uh flip shift. Alright. See if I do a flip shift. Hand empty the supra patella pouch. First of all, you look at the medial gutter first. This is his medial gutter, can you see? So clearly, lateral gutter. So once, if you lie the patient down, already don't have this gutter, then you do properly and carefully huh? your flip shift because most likely you will be positive. Empty the supra patella pouch. This hand, sweep the medial side to the lateral side to empty it, the medial gutter, push from lateral. So negative. You look carefully. You look carefully. Just demonstrate to your uh, examiner that you know where to look and all that. Uh, okay, again, uh, empty the suprapatella pouch. And empty the media aspect. Push. Look here. Any kind of wave like that, you know, coming to the media gutter and feel it. But what is the prerequisite to do this split shift test? The knee must be. Yes, must be in a fully extended position. If those severe knee OA, the patient has got a contracture like this, when you put the patient's leg down, don't please don't perform a flip shift test on this kind of knee. Alright, that's wrong. Alright. <clears throat> then after that, you see, look, feel, then move. But usually, I will look, move, then feel. Because, uh, in my opinion, that's much more smoother. Alright, because if not, uh, you flex and then you palpate ready, and then you move, 
then you come out and then you go down then after that you go up again to do an anterior drawer there. I feel that it's a bit not so smooth. Alright? So to make it more smooth, you see what I do is now look uh move only that I feel. Okay, can you flex your knee all the way? Okay? Can you extend your knee? So what I'm trying to see carefully here is is there any hyperextension? Hyperextension because ligamentous laxity patient, they can have hyperextension. And that is going to uh, uh, slightly change your management. Uh, and a patient with an uh, increase in ligamentous laxity, they are at the risk of uh, ligament rupture also. Uh, okay, all right. So move, uh, uh, then after you just comment. The knee flexion goes from 0 to 135 degrees. That's what Prof. Kwan always said. It's always 15, 15 degrees, right? 90, 105. And then uh, 120, 135, and then 135, and then symmetric of both sides. Only then I will feel. Okay, place at 90 degree, both here at the same side. Then after that, request for permission to sit on the patient's foot. Okay, sekarang saya akan tekan kalau ada sakit bagi tahu saya lah. Just pop it gently and slowly. Start from your tibia tubercle. Okay, tibia tubercle. You see, uh, this one is just to use to support only. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to press, you know. Otherwise, there'll be multiple points. Then you don't know where is the tenderness ready. Just using this to support only. Tibia tubercle, patella tendon. Soft spot next to the medial border of the patella tendon is a medial joint line. Then, on the other side is a lateral soft spot. It's a lateral joint line. Then, you go across slightly medial and lateral to the patella. Then, you palpate the medial, uh, the lateral femur condom. Come down, head of fibula. Then, you go according to the medial proximal tibia per two. And then, go up to the medial femur condom. Why I palpate all this condom? Because one of your differential diagnoses is osteochondral injury. Osteochondral injury, then they can have pain. Alright? So, you palpate and then just comment. Joint line tenderness is a more sensitive test for meniscus then. Alright? So medial then medial meniscus, lateral then lateral meniscus. Alright. Then after do it, after that, <coughs> you come down. What you see from the side. Any posterior sagging. Alright, how do I see posterior sagging? You see usually your this tibia tubercle will come up more or less like this, and then after that only then come down. There's like an angle like that. If I posterior sagging, you won't be able to see this angle. It'll be going towards the back. But uh, sometimes it may not be very easy. Even my colleague, just recent exam, uh, it's a PCL there. Then he thought it's an ACL there. Because he didn't correct back to the original position yet. Mm. Okay, so you just need to be careful. Uh, of course, there are other things that we can do to, <coughs> to elicit whether there's any posterior sagging or not. This is called a cut test. But not routinely practiced. But uh, there's something that it can help you. For example, you've got your like, credit card or your name card and all that, right? Mm. So you just put it here. Alright, then it should be like this. Alright, but when there's a posterior sagging, it'll be like this. So you go all the way back up already. Understand? Alright, that's one of the tests, but not routinely performed, but something that can guide you. Alright, then after that, you see there's no posterior sagging. The first thing you need to palpate the medial tibia step off. Medial tibia step off, because tibia is usually slightly more anterior when the knee is flexed like that. It's slightly more anterior compared to the femur. So you need to palpate both sides. Palpate both sides and compare first. Alright? If they are not comparable, you need to correct back so that both are at the same side. Understand? Media tibia step off. Then after that, your thumb at the soft spot. Your thumb at the soft spot. These fingers behind palpate the hamstring tendon. They need to be relaxed first. If it's not relaxed, your drawer test is going to be accurate. Okay? Again, uh, thumb, thumb, soft spot, soft spot. Here, finger, palpate the hamstring tendon. Okay. Make. So can you try on the other leg? Because we can. Oh, okay. This one, medial lateral border of the patella tendon. So adjacent to it, you see the depression here? This is a soft spot. Thumb at the soft spot, thumb at the soft spot. This finger, palpate the hamstring tendon. Make sure it's relaxed. Then after that, you perform anterior drawer, posterior drawer. Okay? If the patient has got a posterior sagging, 
you need to bring it back first to the original position okay you palpate you can see the media step off ready symmetrical both sides ready only then you further do your anterior drawer test huh? otherwise you'll get a false positive anterior drawer test understand then posterior drawer test anterior drawer then posterior drawer okay all right now black man test all right now just relax this fully extended at about 30 degrees of knee flexion this one stabilize this hand underneath the patient's posterior aspect of the tibia lift it up okay all right see whether there's any excessive translation or not leg man test this leg man test is useful during the acute stage acute knee injury why because you see just now has got to be 90 degree patient very painful and they will not be able to uh, flex to 90 degree so leg man test is useful in such uh, in such cases all right so leg man test okay <clears throat> Pivot shift test, all right. Pivot shift test, uh, I don't usually do. You can just uh take it out also. No need to do. I mean, uh, it's quite painful for the patient because you got those two already. I think that would be quite good enough. But there is actually a difference. AM bundle is tested by both your uh what do you call anterior drawer test and also your leg man test just now, all right. Because you know your ACL got two bundles. You know right? AM bundle and PR bundle. Pivot shift test is used to test a PL bundle. Uh, so that's a difference. Okay, so if you want to do a pivot shift test, vulgus, vulgus stress, internal rotate the leg. Okay, and then you look at the Gerdes tubercle here because your iliotibia band is attached to the Gerdes tubercle. When there's an ACL rupture, there will be a subluxation of the knee joint already. There will have already been a subluxation. So, when you slowly, passively flex the knee to approximately 30 degree, then this iliotibia band will pull the knee and relocate it. That's called a pivot shift test. Okay, so you look at the movement around here. From subluxated, it becomes relocated. Okay, that's a pivot shift test. Rarely I do. Okay, now, vulgus and various stress tests. So you need to align the patient towards the edge of the bed. Can you lie here at the edge of the bed? Okay, then after that, here, put it here your hand on top but I don't know this is the proper way la, but sometimes I just put here because I feel that I can control more like during my recent exam I start with the proper way first I find it a bit difficult and go to my usual way it's up to you but why, why they put it up here because they want to palpate the joint line see how much is opening up alright so when the knee is extended you do the vulgus various stress test so vulgus stress test is like this you push it inside isn't it vulgus stress test so you are checking the which ligament? Yes, correct, very good. So when you do a various stress test, you are checking? Okay, but when you do it in the extended position, what else are you checking? Yeah, all your crucial ligament as well. So that's why, then you, you flex it at 30 degree. And then after that, you do the vulgus and various stress test again, because now you are relaxing the posterior capsule. All right, now you are really isolating the MCL or LCL. At 30 degree fraction like this or pay the joint line feel the opening up you need to feel more because uh, during my initial stage like as a medical student or early amateur so i find it a bit difficult you know while girls various stresses but you go to sports clinic more and all uh, some relief especially those knee oa very severe various one you can feel and then you can even feel the crepitus clack, 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 like that. Uh, so. right then after that then you ask for permission from the examiner to go towards the left side can I examine the patient from the left side? Yeah, because he's always on the right side. Okay, so after that, <clears throat> you're going to do a McMurray's test. Okay, so remember, McMurray's test, there's a lot of different, different, different uh, that you will see. Some various and internally rotate, some various and externally rotate. But in UM, we do like this. Just remember, out and out. Out and out is the same. Then in and in. Just remember that, very easy. Alright, so you flex your knee. Now you bring the knee out. Now you are doing a various test. So when you do a various test, you are putting your stress where? Media or lateral compartment? Media compartment. You see? If your knee is various, it's media compartment. Uh, this is tightened. Uh, this tightened over the media aspect. So various stress. Now you are checking the middle compartment, you know already, right middle compartment. So in order to grind the middle compartment, you need to externally rotate. 
Yeah. yeah. This is my knee. This is my down there. And then now I already put the stress here because of the various. So I need to externally rotate. That's it to grind the compartment. Alright, so knee go outside, the leg go outside like this. Slowly extend. Okay, so now you're checking the medial meniscus. Then you can actually even know where is the location of the tear. Now when the patient complain of pain, huh? alright, then when it is in hyperfection, you're checking the posterior horn of your medial meniscus now in hyperfection. Alright. And then when it comes to the middle here, you're checking the body of the medial meniscus. When it goes towards almost extended position, you're checking the anterior horn. So from posterior horn to body to anterior horn of your medial meniscus. Out and out. Alright. Now, in and in <coughs> is the other way around. You're checking the which compartment? Lateral. Lateral compartment. You do a valgus. Now valgus. Okay, stress is here. Then you go in and in. You grind this compartment. Okay. So there's a concept behind it. Because you will see different, different. Later you just, you remember today and after that, the next day you forget today, you will type Google, then you will see internal rotate or external rotate, different, different books, right? Different, different things. Alright? So you end, we do this. So that's McMurray's test. And then after that, you're going to turn the patient prone. You do a dial test. Heard about dial test before? D I A L. So you're gonna ask your examiner to help you stabilize your thigh. I straight away ask my examiner because I got a sports case. Can you come? <clears throat> so the examiner is gonna help you stabilize like this. Like this. Okay? Stabilize. Ask your examiner to help you stabilize. Knee flex at 30 degrees. Actively externally rotate the patient's foot. And then look at how much is the degree of external rotation. If that is an asymmetry more than 10 degree of external rotation, it indicates that there is a posterior lateral corner injury. Not PCR, just PLC. Posterior lateral corner injury, PLC. Go back and find out the three structures that makes up the PLC. External rotate. Then after that, you flex the knee to 90 degree of flexion, then again, you actively externally rotate again. If again, that is an asymmetry of more than 10 degrees, it indicates that there are two pathologies, PCL and PLC. If it is isolated here, it's PLC. If it is here, there's an asymmetry more than 10 degrees, two pathologies, PLC and PCL. Okay? All right, now, you need to turn back. So now, you check for the screening for the uh, neurology, not to say neurology, but rather the power uh, of the lower limb. L2, go up, then let me push it down, L2, L3, straight, then let me push it down, L4, bukulali light, and then this one, L5, and then S1, check one by one. Alright, check the muscle power, why? Because you want to perform a knee uh, surgery, alright, they need to have a good Neurology, you don't have good power. Alright, then after that, you check the vascular. DPA, PPA, and end your examination with a Baton score. Okay, come, I show you a Baton score. Can you just uh, stand up here? So, for knee ligament or shoulder instability case, nah, this kind of instability or ligament rupture, you need to do a Baton score. Alright, so Baton score, there are nine, and it is considered positive when it's four or more. Right. You see different different uh, different different cutoff point. Some put four, some put six, especially for pediatric because pediatric usually are much more ligamentous legs, right? So sometimes they take a cutoff at six or more. But generally speaking, here you can safely say there's a four or more is considered legs. Alright. So first, hyperextension. You do like this. Hyperextension of the elbow. If there is hyperextension, then it's Baton score one, two, and then after that three. That's sufficient to do this. Uh, can touch the forearm or not. Okay? And then after that, the other one is the MCPJ, could it be flexed more than 90 degrees? If more than 90 degrees, another point. Alright? So, on the upper limb, you already got six points. One, two, three, four, five, six. Knee hyperextension. Just now, you would have really inspected. So, actually, by right, you don't have to repeat anymore. Okay? Seven, eight, any hyperextension of the knee. 
And lastly, the tapak tangan boleh sampai lantai atau that's number nine. Alright, so yeah, let's play first. Okay, alright, understood so far? Okay, thank you so much. Yes, any questions? So far. Yes. Yeah, sorry, can huh? you repeat again? But... <laughs> yeah, yeah, can, can, can. can. Palpation of the knee. Palpation of the knee, can. Okay, so just lying down. Flat at 90 degrees. Use one finger to palpate gently and slowly. The other hand just to stabilize but don't palpate. Otherwise there will be multiple points. You don't know where is the tender point. Start from tibia tubercle. Go up patella tendon. Lateral joint line. Medial joint line. Around the patella. On the patella, and then lateral femur condyle, medial femur condyle, lateral proximal tibia plateau, medial proximal tibia plateau, and probably around the head of fibula. Why we check this femur, femur because of osteochondral injury. Here also osteochondral injury. Head of the fibula is your attachment of your lateral collateral ligament. If there is any rupture, any tear. Huh? then it could be uh, painful and it could be tender. Just, yeah, just go slow and cover everything here. Okay, all right. Can I? Go. Uh, uh, I, I don't think that's important. Uh. I cannot, uh, I don't know what kind of pathology is trying to this one because if you rotate like that, it can be medium, it can be lateral. Uh, Nah, uh, tempurung, ah, uh, tergelor, kemudian dah reduce. That's your patella lah. Alright. Then after that, sekarang, sometimes dia boleh tergelor juga. If that kind of uh, history is the one that you get, then you do these three things to determine your patella stability. Hello. Ah. Okay. So first, you go according to your patella facet. Alright. Usually, if there is a patella dislocation, it will be laterally translated. Alright, so this is your patella. This is a femur. You will go like this. So, if there is any painful region, alright, it's going to be at the medial patella here and also the lateral femoral condyle, which was like this. It's rubbing. Okay, alright. So, if there is any patella instability, you want to see if there's any tenderness around the medial patella facet and also over the lateral femoral condyle. That's number one. Number two, you translate the patella. Is it more than two quadrants? So, you palpate the media and the lateral border of the patella. You divide them into four quadrants. A bit kurang, four fingers. A bit kurang. All right? If this patella, as you move, can translate more than two quadrants, that's considered positive. Because it's considered abnormal and positive. Lah. It shouldn't uh, in a normal patient. All right? Then number three, you do a patella apprehension test. How you do? You push your patella laterally, maintain it at the lateral position, you passively flex the patient's knee. Then look at the patient's face. Is it going to come out or not? The patient will stop you from going further because patella apprehension test is positive. Alright? And then, <clears throat> if you, you can remember, then you do this one. You try to grab the lateral border of the patella and then tear it up. It's called a patella tip, lateral patella tip. Why? Because when they have a uh, patella instability, this, because usually we have these two structures, one, right? Okay. One is pulling, one is trying to pull it so that it becomes stable. Usually when there's an injury here and associated with the tightness over the lateral structure. So when you do your lateral patella state, you're actually trying to check the tightness of the lateral structures. Hmm. So usually if it's a, uh, they will have very, they will, it will be very tight. You won't be able to lift it up. Hmm. So the lateral retina column is stuck. Okay, so these are the tests for patella instability. May come out in your edema, maybe, I don't know. But for us, it's very common. Lah. Although you rarely see in clinic, like for example, my three months in squat, I see two only. But tiba -tiba in edema is a lot. Right? Right? Because usually, I, I think this kind of patient, they may not need to go for surgery. They are very stable and they are already in a pool of patient. So every year, they just come only. For exam, mm, okay, patella instability. Okay, all right.
You mean the patella grinding also, right? Yeah, patella grinding for the patella femoral joint arthritis. Uh. Just grind it only, see whether there's any pain or not. That's all. That's for, that's for OA case, uh, in patella femoral joint arthritis. Okay. okay. Just want to ask, how about the foot? How about, how do no. we need to keep the distance close or how wide should we open up? So usually shoulder level. Shoulder level. Yeah, level. Shoulder level. That's then the foot should facing forward or it's okay? No. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So that's why only when you place your patella forward, then you comment on the foot whether it is internally rotated or externally rotated. I see. Uh, you don't put your feet forward together. Okay. Uh, the reference is Thank patella. You, okay. Alright. The other one is a, a sports knee patient. Okay. We talk about OA first. <clears throat> so your provisional diagnosis, primary OA, okay, particularly if it is a genuvarum, elderly patient, we put a primary OA. But your differential diagnosis will include secondary knee osteoarthritis. For example, secondary to inflammatory arthritis, such as huh? RA. RA, okay. What else? Or your seronegative mm -hmm. uh, arthropathy, for example, your psoriasis, your reactive arthritis, Jorgen syndrome, so on and so forth. Lah. All these are secondary. Then other secondary include some secondary to metabolic disorder, for example, gouty arthritis, pseudo gout arthritis. It can be due to secondary to trauma, infection. Okay, this can lead to OA as well. All right. So primary OA. Secondary OA, secondary OA got inflammatory causes, got metabolic causes, got secondary to trauma infection. Then other causes include could be a referred pain from the hip, all right, or it could be degenerative meniscus tear. These are your differential diagnosis. Degenerative meniscus tear. I'm talking about old patient ah. Uh. Hmm, maybe they don't have OA, but there's a very bad tear in their meniscus that's giving the, them this pain. All right. Okay, so the next thing is you want to do a. Yeah, what's your name? Insane. Okay, so you want to order what? Now, imaging. In. Very good, but must be weight bearing lah. AP lateral. Okay, yeah, that's the answer. I want to order a plane radiograph of patients, right knee or left knee, in AP lateral, uh, weight bearing view and the skyline view. Okay. Alright, so you just basically mentioned that you want to look for the four features. LOSS, loss of joint space, osteophyte formation, subchondrosis, subchondrosis sclerosis. That's it. We cover the features of OA. Right. Then after that, you don't need any other investigation already, really. No need CD scan, no need MRI, no need ultrasound, just x-ray. Okay? Alright. And it is a radiological diagnosis, huh? Huh? Osteoarthritis is not clinical. It's radiological diagnosis. Right, then management. Conservative and surgical all right so conservative treatment again are the same only rest activity modification physiotherapy range of motion exercise quadriceps strengthening anti-inflammatory medication during the acute pain uh, you can use the uh, walking aid to offload the joint all right now if there's a knee oa you can encourage them to do certain exercise all right for example these are the good exercise tai chi number two swimming Number three, uh, slow jogging. And then number four, stationary bike. Why? Because you need to promote loading across the joint, but not causing too much stress to the knee joint. If you do not promote loading, the bone does not remodel well, that's one thing. And then number two is that your muscles are going to be weak. So you need some certain tension, you know, who will be working on the knee, but not too high impact. All right, so those are the suitable exercises. Obesity, reduced weight, can help to reduce the pain as well, alright? So you should suggest them to lose at least like 10% of their body weight, alright? But they, they are going to tell you one problem, Real, reality is that they are fat, they are, they are painful. So you ask them to do exercise to reduce weight, they won't be able to do that because they are going to tell you it's very painful. So diet, lah. dietary restriction, that's one thing. And then the other thing, if they are morbidly obese, refer to bariatrics for surgery, bariatric surgery to reduce the weight. Okay, all right. So those are the conservative treatment. Sorry, for the walking aid, uh, can you tell like uh, for knee pain on the right, then where should they hold the 
working eight and for the heat as well. Okay, so basically on the uh, on the for the knee is ipsilateral side. And then for the hip is contralateral side. Okay, this one you need to remember. And then it depends on what you are using, but usually it will be approximately six inches, six inches or six centimeter, six inches, six inches anteriorly and four inches laterally from the tip of your foot, the placement of your walking aid. Okay, but basically knee is ipsilateral side. And hip is contralateral side. That's what you need to know. Alright. Uh, the the reason behind it is because of the biomechanics, uh, uh, which I don't think you need to know. The lever arm and all at the moment. Okay. Alright. So um, surgical. Alright. So if there is a failure of the conservative treatment, you can consider surgery, which can be either uh, total knee replacement or unicondyla knee replacement. Unicondyla means they just change one side only lah. They just change like media, then media only. Lateral, then lateral only. All right. Okay, and then after that, knee fusion is another uh, is another option. But try not to mention knee fusion first. Uh. Okay. Now, somewhere in the middle, you will see that maybe your family members and all that auntie uncles went for your HA injection, right? Mm -hmm. I'm sure you heard about HA injection. Basically, the consensus is that nice guideline and AAOS guideline they do not recommend HA injection. If they ask you, you can just quote these two, AAOS and and NICE guideline. They do not recommend HA injection. They also do not recommend glucosamine and chondroitin. Okay, but we still give. All right, we still give. Uh, uh, how to say? Uh? Partly because we probably don't advocate it. But if the patient asks for it, we counsel properly, and then after that, uh, it's up to them. It's up to them. But uh, for glucosamine, usually it's after six months. You tell them the effect will probably only start after about six months for glucosamine and chondroitin. HA injection is after about a couple of weeks. A uh, couple of weeks. After about two weeks, then you will start to have the effect. But sometimes this uh, relief can be very short term only. Alright, now the theoretical benefit or the theoretical mechanism of action for HA, there are two. Number one, it encourages the endogenous HA production, theoretically. Lah. Huh? When you inject exogenous OA, it encourages endogenous HA production. Number two, it provides viscose supplementation, like lubrication and all that. Huh? So those are the two theoretical mechanism of HA, but uh, they ask you any reference? AAOS and NICE they do recommend. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. So PRP, very good question. So the standard answer is like this: PRP is useful in tendinitis cases, for example, lateral epicondylitis, and its use has been extrapolated into the treatment of OA but the long-term outcome is still under research standard answer for PRP okay again ah. all right so PRP has been found to be very successful in cases of 10 d 90s and hence its use is extrapolated to the management of osteoarthritis but the long-term outcome is still under research standard answer now, they may ask you next. Stem cell. What about stem cell injection? Alright, now you answer like this. Standard answer. Uh, it is still under research. Uh, stem cell is still under research. However, the theoretical disadvantage is that it could be implicated in cancer formation. Why? Because stem cells, you don't know what it's going to differentiate into. It can differentiate into cancer cells, it can differentiate into non-cancerous cells, you don't know. You just inject only. With the hope that it will, you know, it will differentiate into a good cell, but it may differentiate into cancer cells, you don't know. So that's a standard answer for stem cell. Okay, any questions so far? For knee osteoarthritis? How about the PRC? Sorry? PRC, the PRC. 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 Pesadine is uh, recommended by our CPG, Malaysia CPG guidelines. Uh, 
But anything further than that, uh, in terms of the exact research data and all that, I'm not too sure. But the only thing I know is that uh, Malaysia CPG, although they do not recommend like glucosamine and all that, but they do recommend Plasidine. Uh, but I'm not sure about the AAOS and the uh, uh, Nice Guideline. What did they say about this Plasidine? Okay, all right. All right, so next, if we're talking about knee ligamentous injury, template is slightly different. Provisional diagnosis, for example, most likely you can say it's a right knee, complete ACL rupture associated with medial or lateral meniscus tear, uh, depending on your finding. Okay. Then your differential diagnosis, osteochondral injury, always put osteochondral injury, or loose body in the knee joint, referred pain from the hip. So I think basically that's it lah. Or sometimes if it's just pain, you know, no instability, then you can put some uh, patella tendinitis, quad recep tendinitis. These are okay. Just pain because those are what that can contribute to pain also. All right, so you got a provisional and differential diagnosis for sports knee. We we'll talk about imaging. All right. So yeah, what do you want to order? For a sports knee ligamentous injury, what is the imaging modality? Yeah, I'll start with pain, X ray, AP, and femoral weight bearing. Yes, very good. So, pain with regard of the patient's knee in AP and a lateral weight bearing view. You are not trying to see if there's any uh, associated fracture per se, like big fracture or tibia plateau fracture per se, but rather the bony avulsion fracture. You are looking for any ACL bony avulsion fracture, PCL bony avulsion fracture. You're looking for any Sagon fracture. Heard before Sagon fracture, right? So that's pathognomonic of your ACL tear. All right, go back and find out the picture on the Sagon. It's seen in the AP view, that's pathognomonic ACL. Now, if it's a chronic ACL injury or chronic meniscus tear, for example, two years and above, you also can mention, I want to look for features of osteoarthritis. It's a chronic injury. Look for features of osteoarthritis. Do you do MRI? Yes, all right. So again, it's a clinical diagnosis. You don't need an MRI, particularly if the patient is a, a low demand, not keen for surgery. The reason that you do an MRI is because you want to identify if there's any other associated injuries which you want to tackle during the operation. For example, osteochondral injury. For example, meniscus tear. Okay. Well, sometimes uh, your meniscus, uh, you don't know media, lateral, weight, weight, and they sometimes you've got pain, but then your clinical examination is not, it's not very sensitive and all that, you know. So yeah, that's when you do an MRI, uh, pre-operatively, only when they are keen for surgery. ACL is clinical, uh, drawer tests or all that. So what kind of patient will need to go for surgery? Three. Number one, failure of conservative treatment. After usually about six months like that. Failure of conservative treatment whereby they report persistent instability, recurrent instability. Number two, high demand athletes. High demand athletes, you need to reconstruct for them. Number three, high risk occupation. For example, policemen, uh, they need to run. Firefighters, they need to run. They need to do a lot of all this pivoting and all that during their daily occupation, uh, daily work related activity. Again, uh, three criteria for surgery, for ACL reconstruction. Failure of conservative treatment. So that means patient complain of a recurrent instability. Number two, high demand athletes. Number three, high risk occupation. Okay. So when they, there is this, any of these three, then after that you do a MRI, evaluate the associated pathology, then you go in. All right. So the surgi uh, the conservative can be divided into conservative and surgical. Uh, all right, conservative for all these uh, the, 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 do not fit into any of those three groups that I mentioned just now. So conservative, price, protection, rest, ice, compression, elevation. Okay, and then after that, once the pain and the swelling subside, then you start the physio range of motion and all that. Okay. We don't typically prescribe an ACL brace in our clinic. You don't see an ACL brace pre-operative. Huh? I'm talking about pre-operatively. So all those are acute ACL injury and all that. No need ACL brace. All right. Uh, but post ACL recon, yes, there's a knee brace that they need to wear. Huh? 
Okay, so conservative just price only, no? just conservative uh, facial quadriceps ROM. If they don't have instability, that's fine. If they have instability, then do surgery. Then the surgical intervention is a uh, same exact template that should be coming out from your mouth. I would like to perform an arthroscopic right knee ACL reconstruction using ipsilateral hamstring autograph with meniscus repair okay, like, depends on whether media or lateral lah, huh? you just add in KIV partial meniscectomy that's a standard one you see even our OT leaf is always added Arthroscopic right knee ACL reconstruction using ipsilateral hamstring autograph with meniscus repair KIV partial meniscectomy. But if during your physical examination there is no sign pointing towards meniscus, for example, no joint tenderness, memories, that's all negative, just instability of an ACL, then you slightly change your sentence to do a arthroscopic right knee ACL reconstruction. KIV, meniscus repair. KIV. Why? You go in, do the scope, you inspect the meniscus first. If there is the tear, only then you repair. If no tear, no need to repair. Mm. So you change your sentence. KIV, meniscus repair. If from your physical examination, no sign pointing towards meniscus. Okay, alright. Now, um, the next thing is that you roughly need to know a little bit about your ACL rehab protocol all right so post operatively how do we rehab our patient so they will be need to put on the knee brace for six weeks for actually do we use a different tendon tendon uh, yeah usually bone patella tendon bone graft uh. okay. mm, yeah. but uh, i don't think you need to know so much about all these uh, different different advantages and disadvantages of each of these graphs uh. we've got three types of autograph we've got allograph we've got synthetic graph each of them has its own advantages and disadvantages. That's for postgraduate. Alright. Um, rehab protocol. Alright. So if without meniscus repair, if without meniscus repair, six weeks of uh, ACL brace and uh, immediately after operation you can allow flexion from zero to ninety degree already. But if it is an ACL plus meniscus. First two weeks, 0 to 30. Two to four weeks, 30 to 60. Four to six weeks, 60 to 90. Slowly step it up. You do not want to jeopardize your meniscus repair. And if it is an ACL record, you can allow the patient to slowly wait back. But if it is a meniscus, do not wait back at least for six weeks. At the same time, you also want to more optimize their brain range of motion ask them to do exercise range of motion and then you want to ask them to do the patella mobilization right otherwise there will be adhesion of the patella six weeks to three months all right you ask them to do close chain kinetic exercise what is close kinetic chain exercise anybody know the foot is planted on the ground this is close chain close chain means your foot is planted on the ground and then, for example, like this, sitting here, foot planted on the ground, ask them to rise on the chair. The foot is not, is fixed to the ground, it's planted. This is closed kinetic chain exercise. So they can, you should start with the closed kinetic chain exercise first. Only after that, they, if they are okay with that already, facial access and all that, they are okay, then you, you do open kinetic chain exercise. This is open kinetic chain exercise. The foot is not planted on the ground. It's open kinetic. You put more stress on your graph. So that's why you start with a closed kinetic chain first. Only then you proceed to closed kinetic chain exercise. Alright. So after three months, three months to nine months is a stationary, uh, what do you call? Stationary running, hopping, and all that. Slowly step it out. Lah, and then run in a straight line. So the patient may ask you, Bila saya boleh balik? Return to sport. Nine months. Huh? Standard answer. Nine months. But you also top it up with, but 
that depends on your compliance to rehabilitation. So some patients can be slightly faster, some patients will be much longer. Depends on their compliance to rehabilitation. Okay, all right. Okay, so far, any question? Yes. Yes, by right you can because it can be divided into grade 1, grade 2, and grade 3. Right? Grade 1, less than 5 millimeter translation. Grade 2, 5 to 10 millimeter translation. Grade 3, more than 10 millimeter translation with no firm endpoint. Grade 2, there is a firm endpoint. 5 to 10, and then, oh, yeah. Uh, although it excessively translates, but it stops there. And then when there is no excessive translation, it's only blocked by the skin and all that in front. No firm endpoint, there's grade 3. But to be honest, uh, it's not so important. It's not so important because we are still going to assess using the uh, MRI and all that if really going for operation. For example, in my postgraduate, when I checked, I thought it was grade 2. All right. And then after that, uh, when they showed me the MRI, it was a complete rupture. But I didn't feel guilty also. So I just said, after thorough review of the MRI, I would like to revise my diagnosis from a partial ACL rupture to a complete ACL rupture. Yeah, why not? Just report as it is. Let's go uh, uh, know your stuff and justify your dishonor. It's okay. Huh? Okay, yes. Yes, uh, sometimes in the uh, pediatric patient, we may uh, can do a repair, but try not to mention uh, that one is quite controversial. Still, still controversial. Most of the time, we just do recon. Not most of the time, I mean, all the time, 100% recon. Yes? What is Q angle? Do you think about Q angle is whereby an angle that is subtended by a longitudinal axis from your ASIS to the midpoint of the patella and then from the midpoint of the patella to your tibia tubercle alright so this angle now in a female patient it's about 18 degrees in male patient it's probably about 14 degrees alright uh, when you have an increase in the Q angle it leads to increase in the patella instability more in that kind of cases uh, patella instability cases uh. so when you assess the Q angle you assess it clinically not from the radiograph, but rather you lie the patient down on the couch, identify ASIS, identify midpoint patella, identify tibia tubercle. You draw the line, identify the angle. So, like like I said, if mere 14, then if like you've got 20 and above and so on, you know, then you know that this is one of the reasons for your patella instability and you may want to address that as well. Mm. So how we can address that? We can do a tibia tubercle transfer. You can transfer the tibia tubercle to reduce the Q angle. So for vulgus and varus, we don't need Q angle to say it's vulgus or varus. No, 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 no. Yes. Vulgus and varus, you need to know the concept behind it is that you use intercondylar distance and intermalleolar distance to determine that, not Q angle. All right. So intercondylar distance should be less than six centimeter. Should be less than six centimeter. You stand. Shoulder width, the foot is at the shoulder width. The distance between the two should be less than six centimeter. If it's more than six centimeter, varum. All right. Intermalleolar line should be less than eight centimeter. That's a standard, huh? Okay. All right. Now I just demonstrate to you the uh, I said I want to talk a little bit more detailed regarding the trendon lumbar sign and the trendon lumbar test because you need to get it clear. Can I have a model? Maybe yes. Okay, so when the patient walk, if you have a right side, now you think ah, uh, right side abductor muscle weakness. Can you demonstrate to me how is your trendon lumbar uh, gait? <laughs> yeah, correct. Why not? Yes, all right. So, because of the pelvis is going to get to the right, left side, he's trying to compensate to prevent him from falling down. 
Okay, alright, that's a channel number, gate. Alright. Now, sometimes you can have this, what we call a weddling gate. Wedding gate is bilateral channel number. So they will sway here, they will sway there, they will sway here, they will sway there. And this is usually associated with lumbar hyperlodosis. Do not forget to mention lumbar hyperlodosis. Okay, when they have this, uh, usually when they have uh, bilateral channel number gate. Alright, so now, channel number test. The way to do it is, okay, in front of something so that they can hold on to it if they are about to fall down. Alright, you identify the patient's dimple of venous. Uh, PSIS or the entire pelvis uh, uh, and after that you want to see where does it did and all that all right. so when I ask the patient to lift up the leg not lifting it up like that because they will try to compensate with their hip flexor and all that go like that this is a standard standard way of channel number 10 again uh, a lot of patients if you do not give proper instructions they may go like that that's the wrong one go like that do a seven. Okay, after that, stand on the other side. Okay, alright. So now, you got a right gluteum, uh, right abductor muscle weakness. I palpate like this. And then after that, now I'm going to ask you to stand on the left side first. Stand on the normal side first, okay? Now, right side, leave it up. Okay, so patient will be stable. Okay, now stand on the right side and leave out the left side. Uh, then patient will be very glossy, unstable, and then after that, we'll try to get. Sometimes, some of the tips and tricks that you can see is that patient will feel unstable. Huh? You might not be able to, oh, the service sometimes uh, in your exam uh, being panicky and all that, swing here. But roughly, if it's a normal patient, you see, I don't have a abductor muscle weakness, I'll be able to stand just like that. Just like that. Alright? When they can't, I want to just over and all that. So you know something is wrong with it. Mm, it could be a channel level test positive. Really. Alright? When they can't do that, alright? When they can't do that. So, you can use a different way, alright, that's called a Duchenne, Duchenne test, your Duchenne muscular dystrophy, mm -hmm. Duchenne test, so what you do is that, ask them to place, and then after that, uh, try to leave it out, uh, or stand on your normal left side first, so okay, normal, pressure is the same, then stand on the, uh, this one, and then they are going to place more, on where? No, opposite side. Why? Because they want to push themselves towards that side. Understand? You got the right hip pathology. Now, your pelvis is going to tear everything. So you want to prevent you from falling down, you're going to go towards this side. So you're going to put the pressure here to press myself towards this side. To prevent myself from falling down. Left hand. Left hand is going to push. You see? You push my side here to go there. If you push here, you fall down already. Understand? Okay, huh? All right. So I hope you all are clear with the concept of a channel number gate and channel number uh, test. So you see, here we are going to like that, and then they're going to fall down already. I'll put pressure here to bring myself back up. Okay, I put here. Now I'll continue to fall. Okay, huh? Mm -hmm. All right.